Hey everybody, it is Ines Tubaska and this is IFS Podcast, the show where you get the knowledge and inspiration to reinvent yourself. Today I have another great guest. His name is Jeff Rothschild. He is a registered dietitian with a master's degree in nutritional science. He works with a variety of elite tennis players, uh, endurance athletes, boxers, swimmers and a number of musicians. He explores different aspects of performance, nutrition, recovery, and has a pretty deep understanding about factors beyond just food and movement that have an impact on the way humans perform and sustain health. Today we'll dive into some of these topics like circadian biology, fasting, fueling for peak performance versus peak adaptation, and the way Jeff implements all of these with different athletes and in different contexts. So hello Jeff and thank you for being my guest today. Hey there, thank you for having me. Uh, for listeners unfamiliar uh, with your background, could you share how you got involved in nutrition and endurance sports and uh, how you became so good at actually using evidence-based nutrition and applying it into the practice of elite athletes in different sports? Yeah, so I did. Uh, I went to school for nutrition. I did my master's degree in nutritional science. Um, became a registered dietitian, and uh, during that time, and actually before that time, I've been a cyclist. So you know, racking up miles my, on my own, you start to learn things, just how food affects your performance, and then adding the school portion, you put it together into how to make smart decisions based on research. So you learn how to uh, read research and understand it and interpret it, and then applying it again initially uh, on myself, and then as I moved it uh, into the job working with more and more people and seeing what works, what doesn't, what translates better, uh, you know, out of the lab and into the field and, and things like that. So it's kind of a, a mix of reading research and putting it into practice and then seeing how that lines up. Uh, that's great. And I think that before that you used to be a musician. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I did spend about 10 years uh, as a drummer, a mixer and a recording engineer. So I was making a lot of records. It was a great career. I really enjoyed it. And during that time was, was when I got into cycling and, and nutrition was really a hobby at that point. And I enjoyed learning about it. And, and for a while I was content with just riding my bike and, and, you know, learning on my own. But at a point I got progressively tired of the music industry and I just didn't enjoy it very much. And so uh, there was a point, yeah, probably about maybe six or seven years ago now where I started transitioning out of that and again went back to school and, and did all the all these things and, and I'm uh, really happy that I made that change. That's really inspiring because I think that a lot of people are not content with what they're doing but they just don't find the courage to uh, make such a dramatic shift. Uh, what would you tell them? How did you find the strength and courage to make such a huge change in your life? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, and, and I guess just to give people a little bit more context. I mean, I was, I was, um, I don't talk about it very often. I guess you heard it on another podcast where I yes, talked I about did. this, but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, you know, having a very successful career, but I, I, I really, I just really didn't enjoy it. So I thought, okay, well, how could I, you know, here, here's where I'm at now. And then here's where I want to be. I want to be a, a sports dietitian. And so how do I get there? So, okay, well, I need to go back to school, maybe a master's degree, I need to, you know, be a registered dietitian, all, all these things, I figure out all the steps that I needed to take to get at least established in a new career and having a sustainable new career. And then I figured out which of that I could do while still working in music full time. And then how much of those things I needed to do full time, meaning going back to school. So I and stopping music. So then I figured out, well, what could I do during that time? I still you know, I saved some money, but I also still wanted some income coming in. So um, I also was doing uh, some strength training at that time, and I, I still do a little bit now. So I, I kind of figured out how, how could I make it work, basically. You know, here's where I'm at. Here's where I need to be. And how, how can I feasibly, you know, without, you know, going broke or, um, you know, starving myself, how can I get, make a sustainable transition? So I just mapped it out. I figured out what classes I needed to take you know, uh, how I could work, all, all these things, all the logistics and just wanted a clear path. And, and it certainly was a, a big leap any, even with that, because again, I was going from a very established position to literally the bottom. I mean, I was starting in a new field completely from scratch. So I just had to 
have some faith and confidence that my the skill set that I've developed would serve me as well in a new career as it did in the previous career. Uh, that's really great that you pointed out because I also think that uh, the skills uh, just need to be adapted in the different area and the way you excel in one area is the same way you excel in different area. You just need the knowledge and some consistency in order to improve your skills. Yeah, that's no, that's exactly right. And that's what I, I was hoping was the case. And I, I, I had some confidence that it would be, but I mean, all these skills, exactly. So showing up on time, being a good learner, you know, being enthusiastic and interested in things and, and all the, you know, any career, any field, it's all these same skills that serve us well. So um, as long as you can give it the proper time and, and nurture these skills in any field, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's really the, the key, I believe. And, and how did you, um, uh, how did people start uh, uh, looking for you, uh, the endurance athletes? I mean, uh, was it that you were leading by example at the things you did and you applied to your own practice? Uh, were just uh, showing the results and that how people started following you and uh, looking for your advice and your help? Yeah, that's a good question. A little bit of both. Um, certainly knowing some, being in the, the world of you know endurance sports, so riding bikes and, and knowing people in this area. So I'm in Los Angeles, California. So I, I, I knew some people in the community, and that certainly helped. I did a lot of talks to groups, so talks to cycling groups or you know and, and triathlon groups. Uh, again, working with su a few people, and then that hopefully getting some good results. It's been a, a very slow uh, but steady build. So I started off, you know, I was not very busy as would be expected, uh, and then again just consistent work and I'm still building the practice and you know getting hopefully good results more often than not and and that way it spreads and still working very hard so doing like I said talks I enjoy talking to groups actually so it's a good way to not only educate a group of cyclists or triathletes that maybe don't know how to fuel effectively for their training or for a race so you give you know it those are enjoyable things for me to do but then also it builds uh it builds clients and um yeah so it's it's been uh, I guess there's a few avenues um, but it's just it's definitely a, a slow and steady approach to it. Yes, and you have some uh, pretty great insights about uh, endurance, uh, about nutrition and fueling for endurance athletes, so I can't wait to share some of this with uh, uh, our listeners. And um, uh, you work with a lot of endurance athletes who have different demands than a recreational athlete or a strength athlete. Uh, and you have uh, this interesting take on fueling for peak performance versus peak adaptation. Will you share more about this concept and how you put it into practice with your athletes? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and by no means is it my take on it. I just have read a lot and, and a lot, I read a lot of research from some really smart people that are doing this great research. And, and again, it's about taking that research and putting it into practice. Uh, so. With that being said, yeah, there, there's really, most people think of, if, you know, if I asked what are carbohydrates for, and you would probably say fuel, which is true, but what most people don't think about, and I wouldn't expect them to, is that it also acts as a signal inside your body. So I like to use the analogy of a gas tank in our muscles, and we store carbohydrate, and most people are aware of that. But depending on how full that gas tank is, the effects of an exercise session are going to be different. And what I mean by that is if you just go out, let's say, just call it a, for a bike ride, an, an easy paced but long duration bike ride. So someone might ride for three or four hours. If their gas tank, if they start with a gas tank full and they keep taking sports drinks and gels and, and carbohydrates and all, all through the ride so that their gas tank never really gets low, that's, that's what a lot of people do. Okay. If that same person went on the same ride but started with a gas tank that was low and didn't take sports drinks or, or gels or, and things and just drank water, they would get actually a lot more adaptation out of that workout. And what I mean by that is most people also, and I, and I wouldn't expect them to think about this, but if I, if I say what happens when you go on a three-hour or four-hour bike ride, no one really thinks about it, but people, you know, when you stop and think what happens inside your body, well, your, your body gets better. Get, you, you think most people would just say, oh, I get fitter. Your body gets better at, at making energy. But no one, again, stops to think about what that means. Well, what happens is your mitochondria, which are the, we call, 
you usually think of them as the energy powerhouse. So that's where the energy production comes from. These adapt by getting bigger, uh, basically getting better. They get they increase in size and number. Okay, so that signal though to to tell them to get to increase in size and number comes from having a low gas tank or it comes stronger. So thinking back to our analogy or example of the two different bike rides, if, I, if I've gone out with a full gas tank and keep the gas tank full even for three or four hours, there's a lot, uh, as opposed to going out with an empty gas tank and, and keeping the gas tank low, that low gas tank ride is gonna send a much stronger signal to your body, to your cells, to adapt and increase those mitochondria in the size and number. Now with that being said, your performance on that ride might not be very good. Okay, so again, to kind of recap, you can go out with a low gas tank, you won't feel very good, but you'll probably get a better adaptation out of that session. Now at the same time, or, or let's say the next weekend you have a race, well, you want to go as fast as possible, and that's not the time to worry about the adaptation, but more you're worrying about how, how fast can I go and how long can I sustain this? So if you have a let's say it's a triathlon and, and it might take you six hours to complete, you want to be as fueled as possible in the, in the smartest way possible so that you're able to go uh, fa as fast as you can. The adaptation on that day you're not so concerned about uh, because again, keeping your gas tank very full, you're not gonna get as much of an adaptation, but uh, you, so you're, you're balancing, what's my goal for the day? And this could be true in, during different training sessions too. Do I wanna work on performance? Or is it about the adaptation that day? Does that kind of make sense? Yes, it does. And uh, a lot of athletes seem uh, uh, to not look in the long-term perspective, but just in the short term. How do you structure this concept into practice? Everybody knows that uh, high performance is one of the ultimate goals of athletes, and sometimes they find it hard to accept that this particular workout will not result in peak performance right now, but it will have an effect on peak adaptation and help them progress in the long term. Do you make athletes aware of what they should expect of this nutrient manipulation? Yeah, exactly. And that's the most important part is to explain to someone kind of what we just talked about and explain you want to get the most adaptations out of a workout. And once people kind of think about that, because again, almost I don't think anyone I've ever asked this has ever thought about what happens when you go on these three or four hour bike rides or, or these long runs. No one stopped to think about it. So once you explain... Um, so then, but I should also say some people will do the opposite and always go with a low gas tank, kind of this low carb approach, always go out, do all of their runs, maybe fasted in the morning before they eat breakfast. Now they're going to get some benefits, but at the same time, they're going to be missing the other side. Meaning, uh, when you really want to go fast, you need to be good at burning carbohydrates. So if someone only does their training on an empty stomach or, or, you know, with a low gas tank, they're not going to be uh, training that ability at the top end, their, their very peak ranges, to be burning carbohydrates quickly. And that's also a problem. So the answer then, how do we implement it, is to figure out which training sessions during the week or over a course of a couple weeks are very key for adaptation, meaning usually the long distance, low intensity, or they could be shorter duration and perhaps high intensity. And then balancing that with the, the more race pace efforts. So if there's, maybe there's a, a brick, so for triathlon, they might, let's say there's a, a 60 mile bike ride followed by a 10 mile run. Well, that, uh, in that case, we'd want to, that would be a good chance to practice the race day fueling. And you would fuel, you know, again, as close as you could to race day, which would be generally very high carb intake with, with, for the most part. So it's understanding, again, in the course of a week or a month. So I will also, get, so I will give someone a weekly schedule of when their meals should be high carb. So down to the meal, it's not even just certain days, it's certain meals should be higher carb, certain days should be lower carb and moderate carb. So I can plan that out and then I'll use their like training peaks or something like that where their coach has put in their training plans. I can look at that and say, okay, here there's a big workout so we need to increase the carbs or here you have some, some endurance miles so we can have lower carbs and things like that. So it's all really an integrated approach with their training plan and uh, again, knowing the, the point of each workout. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, if we take triathletes, they have a pretty demanding training programs uh, where they are supposed to prepare for swimming, cycling, and running. Is there some kind of nutrition manipulation that can be applied considering the workout an athlete just had and the workout he needs to do next? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's understanding 
what zones the, the given workouts are going to be in or what's the point of the workouts. Is it going to be a hard interval workout? Is it going to be a, a, a long, again, aerobic workout? So I'll, I'll actually take myself, for example, and manipulating the, well, a couple, a couple examples, but I'll give you one. So last night I did a, a pretty hard bike ride. So I did uh, eight by five minute intervals at, at kind of just threshold, a little over threshold pace. So pretty, pretty hard, not, not crazy, but fairly depleting. And then after that, I did not take any carbohydrate and I, I ate, it was in the evening, so I ate dinner with protein only, protein and veg vegetables. And then this morning I woke up and went for a fasted run. Okay, so my body is overnight, there's a, a low carbohydrate availability, as we call it. So the workout has depleted my gas tank. Then I've slept with a low gas tank. I wake up and run about a half hour, nothing, nothing crazy, but enough to um, kind of stress my body more so than if I had gone out for that same run with a full gas tank. Then after that run, then I had a full carbohydrate protein, you know, a, a nice breakfast. Um, another example, so tomorrow um, I'm going to have uh, two hard workouts, a swim and a run separated by several hours. So what you can do is be fully fueled before the first workout, knowing that that first workout is gonna deplete you, and then you could do, you have two options. You could either replete, try and replete fully, or you could leave a low gas tank for that second workout. So you're going to get more out of that second workout, which will be, for me will be a treadmill interval workout. And then after that, then it's a high carb meal to recover. So those are just two small examples of ways to, to get, to pair, to think in a, a pair of workouts, whereas one is fully fueled and then the next one is under fueled. Um, but you, you have to know what to expect from those workouts. Uh, both planning wise and, and also performance wise. Uh, the macro composition of the dinner is a really interesting topic because uh, I heard once you said that uh, the fasted uh, the fasted training in the morning uh, uh, should be uh, you should consider what you ate the night before because sometimes yeah. people do a fasted workout but they actually ate a lot of carbs the night before. Uh, could you explain this further? Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, thanks for bringing that up. So. We have a gas tank in our muscles, so it's called our muscle glycogen. We also have a gas tank in our liver, okay? So uh, overnight, our liver is what keeps our blood sugar from dropping too low. So as we're sleeping, we haven't eaten. If our blood sugar drops, it's our liver's job to use its stored carbohydrate or gas and increase the blood sugar or keep it at a, at a normal level. So by the end of a night, so if you've eaten dinner by 6 or 7 p.m., by the next morning, it's, it's not always depleted, your liver glycogen, but it's definitely lower, okay? But your muscles only get depleted when they've been used, okay? And this is really amazing and interesting. And from an evolutionary perspective, what, there was a study, which I'm sure you've, is what you've heard me talk about, the muscle glycogen, so muscle gas tank, was the same after an overnight fast or after an 84-hour fast, okay? So that means as long as the person is not using their muscles for exercise, the gas tank is not being depleted. Now, if last night after that bike ride, I ate a, you know, a bowl of potatoes or something and my muscle glycogen went back up, then this morning my liver gas tank would be a little bit low, but my muscles would be fully stocked. And so that run, while sure there, there's some, it, it, you know, it's not, it's probably, you're, you're getting still an, an additional benefit from having eaten breakfast, uh, it's not the same because my, my muscle gas tank is not depleted, okay? So because of this, again, last night, I wanted to make sure I did not replete my muscle glycogen. And this is not something you do all the time. It's just, it's just an approach. It's a tool, um, usually referred to as sleep low, meaning you're sleeping with a low uh, gas tank. And you're right. So people that think, oh, I'm just going to do a fasted workout, but I've eaten you know potatoes at dinner the night before, well, yeah, there's some potential benefit, uh, it's not as beneficial as if you had gone out with a low gas tank. Uh, I think that this will be useful for a lot of people that train uh, in a fasted state, but they don't understand what you just explained because it's really interesting. And uh, what about high fat, low carb diets? Do you think that they might have some practical implementation when it comes to the preparation of an endurance athlete and how exactly could that be applied? Uh, that's a good question, and a lot of people love to argue about that. In general, I'm not a fan 
And but, however, I guess you could argue that certain meals, like I, again, just using myself example, the meal last night would have been, I say, I guess, high fat, moderate fat, and low carb, uh, protein and vegetables, and some fat. Um, there is a, a place for it, but again, I think sporadically in meals uh, throughout the week, but not on a regular basis. The reason, so so actually, we'll take a step back, and the reason people like this is. Uh, that they want to improve their ability to burn fat, right? And so that's one of the reasons people do that fast in training. And there is definitely an ability to, to burn fat more efficiently when you do this. And when you follow a low-carb diet or if you do fasted training, there's no question. And that's why there is, I believe, a place for the fasted training or the training twice in a day with the second training session being with a low gas tank. But what happens if you... Do this too long. There's two. I, I see that two two real negative side effects of consistent low carb, high fat training, and that is, as I mentioned before, you lose your ability to burn carbs at the top end. Meaning, um, actually, yeah, I should explain this better. When we're the text from from a text like in the textbook, we sh it shows at a low intensity we rely more on fat for our energy, and then as the in exercise intensity increases, and this is true for everyone we rely increasingly on carbohydrates. So as a full sprint, people are burning predominantly carbohydrates. And the reason for this is because carbohydrates can be turned over, burned for energy more quickly, and they don't require oxygen. So if you're sprinting, doing, let's say, 100-meter sprints over and over, you're going to be relying a lot on carbohydrate. So, um, so people want to say, okay, well, we have a limited carb storage, and we have more or less unlimited fat storage, so it would make sense for me to be better at burning fat. Well, again, if you follow a low-carb, high-fat diet, after even just four, five days, you lose your ability to burn carbs efficiently at the top end. So there's one thing. And for some people doing, let's say, Ironman, it doesn't really matter. But for someone who's like a bike racer, uh, you know, a, a cycling, like a road racer, or you, you need to have a real good top end to sprint or a marathon or even. So that's, that's one thing that happens is you lose your ability to, to burn carbs at the top end. The other bigger issue is that it costs more from an oxygen standpoint to burn fat compared with carbohydrate. So at a given running pace, let's say you're running whatever, uh, uh, it doesn't even matter what, what pace, but some consistent pace, let's say eight minute mile, and you're going to rely on more on carbohydrate or more on fat, you're going to need more oxygen to burn more to rely have more heavily on fat than you would on carbohydrate. So it's more efficient to burn carbohydrate. So this is a big deal because most people you're running, we, we have a limited amount of oxygen our body can process. Okay, this is called VO2 max, which is a maximal aerobic capacity. Basically, how much oxygen your body can, can, can take in and handle. Um, and this is trainable to a degree, but there's also some genetic limits to it. Now, so that means oxygen is always you know, at a premium during endurance exercises, anyone who does it has done it knows. Would you rather spend more oxygen or less oxygen running at the same pace? Well, that's an easy one. You'd rather spend less oxygen, so then you could actually run faster. When you are relying increasingly on fat, you're using more oxygen. So you're going to run at a, to run a given pace, you're going to be going at a higher percentage of your max. Um, you know, there's a, a million ways to, to think about it, but basically it's going to be harder to run relatively speaking, when you're burning fat, then you're burning carbs. Uh, so it's, uh, yes, uh, eating a high fat diet uh, is uh, a lot, uh, really more demanding for the body. And it probably works for one person, but it w doesn't work for a thousand people. So it's better to use the common approach than trying to be just uh, the exception, probably. Yeah. And, and again, I think people, it can work in some ways. And in, all you want to do is, is run at a very low intensity for a long time. And maybe, so maybe if you were doing 100 mile races or 50 miles, or then there's some good utility there. The other I, potential benefit I could see is for people that have GI issues when they fuel too much during races. So if, you're, if you can't handle a lot of carbohydrate during a race, well, it probably means something else is going on. But if that's the case and, and you, you would rather rely more on fat so that you can take in less calories per hour during a long race and that makes you feel better because that will make you faster if you don't have a stomach ache. Uh, again, I, there's reasons that people get GI distress. What, maybe it's 
uh, it wrong, the wrong type of fueling or perhaps some, some SIBO or that, you know, there's a, a, a number of things that it could be, but regardless, if you, if, if you get a stomach ache, you're not going to you feel good and, and enjoy your day. So it, people that go on a low carb, high fat diet, um, they, you know, they'll be using more oxygen, but again, they, they might feel better because they don't have any GI issues. So I see that as, as some, some, uh, you know, some good reason to do that. And well, on the topic uh, about nutrition on competition day, uh, when it comes to uh, competitors in endurance sports, uh, most of them uh, focus a lot on competition day nutrition. But isn't it true that nutrition the days before a competition actually has a tremendous impact on how you perform? And what are your recommendations on this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... The days before you want you want to top up your gas tank. That's kind of an old recommendation, but it's still um, some people I think dismiss it as being kind of outdated. But certainly uh, being on a high carb diet for several days before, and that doesn't mean you know eating insane amounts of, of pasta or something, but certainly higher carb with usually you're you're tapering your training. So if you're eating a higher carb with less training, that's going to be a good way to fill up your gas tank. Making sure you're getting the right minerals. Uh, making sure you know everything is topped up in your body essentially also a day or two before the race I like to recommend very, very low fiber so vegetables this is uh, you know for GI potential GI problems during the race so getting rid of fiber sometimes even dairy a day or two before can really just help people um, just feel better on race day so we look at it that way and yeah again a mix of increasing your intake while tapering your training is usually uh, a pretty good pretty good way to approach it Uh, one of the common problems that most endurance athletes uh, encounter is cramping. Do you think that it has uh, to do mainly with micronutrient intake or is it uh, kind of an individual thing that depends on many factors? Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is kind of a million dollar question. Um, definitely, I think inadequate uh, micronutrient intake can be a factor, but certainly training status can be a factor. This, this probably, you know, five at least have, or, or more different reasons someone can cramp, which is, which makes it tricky because that means the solution to cramping is going to be different for different people. And, and it's sometimes it, it's really tough, but you obviously want to maximize, or, uh, optimize your intake leading into a race and during a race with electrolytes and things like that. And then that, again, that helps some people certainly can delay cramps uh, in people, or if it's something else, sometimes it's even mental. People get stressed or tensed. Um, you'll see people cramp early on. And sometimes I see it in tennis or, or during a race. Like people might cramp after swimming for a half hour. There's no reason, there's no way that's a deficiency in that case. It's more of a tension thing. So, you know, it's, it's um, elusive, I think, to, to figure out um, the cause of cramps. Uh, in, in, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the subject of a lot of debate, I think, in, in the world of sports nutrition. And I'm not sure um, there's an easy answer. Yes, but and do you have some recommendations that work most of the time, probably? Um, well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, I'm a fan of, of increasing salt intake the day before and the morning of. So there's certain products like The Right Stuff um, or Scratch makes something called hyperhydration. They're very similar. Um, that is something I would usually suggest. If, if let's say, someone's doing a long race like an Ironman, and, it, and it's especially in, in warm conditions, uh, I am a fan of... Yeah, I would have them do the, the right stuff the night before and the morning of. Um, or uh, short of that, perhaps getting someone to just have some soups of salty soups, uh, miso soup or other uh, any other kind uh, the night before and ideally the morning of. And that that's, you know, they're at least getting uh, a good whack of salt in. And beyond that, um, you know, it kind of depends on the day, but making sure they're not over drinking um, and, and having adequate sodium in the drinks. So some people will say sodium has nothing to do with cramping, and I, I don't know. I don't have a great answer there, but it seems people seem to do better when they get a little bit more sodium in their drinks than they might be accustomed to. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's not about science, but what actually works. So if people feel better with that, so that's maybe a solution. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make a mild shift and discuss female athletes and some uh, specifics about the menstrual cycle and athletic performance. Uh, you have done in some interesting research and uh, most importantly, uh, you put the science into practice. What are some of the main changes when it comes to body temperature, plasma volumes and fluid needs that the female athlete experiences and uh, 
how could this be taken in consideration when it comes to structuring a training and nutrition program? Yeah, thanks. Good, good question. Um, so yeah, the, the female cycle can have a uh, huge impact on training and performance. And the first thing people need to do is actually track their cycle or women need to do so they know where they're at. And if they have a regular cycle, um, let's assume someone is not on birth control pills and they're on a relatively normal, let's say 28 to 30 day cycle. Okay. So now there's huge variation in the cycle length and, and things, but let's just, we're going to just take the most textbook example again, just to, to illustrate the point. Body temperature goes up at ovulation, which is uh, halfway through the cycle. So there's a, there's a raise, a rise in body temperature, which stays elevated for about seven to 14 days. Now it's not a huge rise, but it's certainly a rise nonetheless. So even if we think of nothing else about this, if you think about your body temperature is starting higher, then what's gonna happen to, for high intensity exercise or exercise in the heat? You're gonna have less heat tolerance, okay? So also, as you mentioned, plasma volume, this changes through the month. So um, I'll kind of just jump ahead. So what happens if, if you, normally, if you ingest some electrolyte beverage, your plasma volume you know, goes up a certain amount. So if you, um, let's say a woman is in the front half of the month, so, or the, the follicular phase, and they take a beverage, uh, you know, a salt, an electrolyte beverage, their, their plasma volume will go up, let's say 6% if they have a liter of this certain beverage. If they drink that same amount of the same drink in the mid-luteal phase, which refers to around days 19 through 24 of the cycle, their plasma volume might only go up by about 3%. What that means is they're not absorbing the fluid and the, and the electrolytes as well uh, during the mid-luteal phase. Okay, so you need to drink more to, to skip to a practical recommendation, in that mid-luteal phase, your body temperature is higher, you need to drink more fluids and use more salt in order to try and hydrate as well as you would during the follicular phase or the front half. Your carbohydrate and, and fat burning changes a little bit as well, but again, to put it into a practical terms, during the front half of the month or the follicular phase, uh, you're, you can do, you should do more higher intense, higher intensity exercise, and you could fuel a little bit more with carbohydrates. And during that mid luteal phase, you, sh you should, you could focus on a little bit of a lower carb diet and work on more endurance exercise. So lower intensity, but longer duration. And you also need a little bit more protein. So this is all, these are all because of the effects that estrogen and progesterone have, um, on muscle catabolism and, and again, fat and carbohydrate oxidation. Um, so again, the, the most, I think, practical things people can do are to track their cycle in the front half of the month, as I call it. So, so ovulation occurs in the middle. So if we call it, we can broadly think of the front half and the back half during that front half, a, a higher carb, lower fat diet, and focus more on the high intense exercise. And during that back half, particularly the mid luteal phase. So days 19 through 24, uh, do a little bit lower intensity exercise and either take recovery week or you can work on, again, long duration, low intensity exercise and fueling a little bit lower carb and higher fat uh, and higher protein. And if you do need to do high intensity exercise during that mid luteal phase, then you will, you should rely a little bit more on uh, outside carbohydrates or so sports drinks or, or gels and things like that. Uh, you've worked with a, a lot of female athletes and you probably know that a lot of women struggle with carb cravings after the mid luteal phase. Do you think that this has something to do with the decreased plasma volume and the need for more sodium? Or is it uh, some kind connected with the diet and not getting enough calories probably? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And, and often with carb cravings, it's people are eating too little protein, especially protein in the morning. Most people don't naturally eat, in my opinion, enough protein in the morning. Yeah. And once you get them eating protein in the morning, and, and we're talking a good, not just an egg or two eggs, but like um, the equivalent of like a chicken breast or, or a protein shake, you know, 25 or 30 grams of protein, maybe Greek yogurt, um, then the, the cravings should reduce a little bit later in the day or just the general hunger. So um, I think, yeah, it's a good, you know, it's a good question. And I don't know that there is a perfect answer to it, but I think getting enough protein, because again, as I said, in that phase, 
you do need your protein needs are increased. So really making sure to focus on protein uh, can, you know, can and should help those things to a degree. Um, I like that uh, you raise the topic of uh, protein in the morning because I think that it also has to do with uh, circadian biology and uh, you also have a deep interest in fasting and circadian biology so I'd love to dedicate some time on these topics and um, from what I've listened and read from you I understand that you recommend a little bit a different approach to fasting and most importantly you recommend fasting between meals throughout the day instead of the standard 16 hours fast 8 hours eating window protocol I wonder if that has something to do with circadian bio biology and how food can entrain circadian clocks Yeah, so so sorry, just to be clear, you're saying th that I talk about not eating between meals? or uh, Yes, or? I think that you recommend that uh, you fast between the meals, uh, if I'm right. Uh, sometimes, yeah, I don't know, that, you know, as a rule, I mean, certainly with people doing, you know, training for sports, I I'm certainly a fan of, of an extra meal after workouts or depending on when the meals are. But if someone is trying to lose weight, then, you know, and they're not, and they're just mildly active, Um, like a recreational gym, gym goer or even less active, then uh, fasting between meals is certainly a good idea. Sometimes if people go have a, you know, a lunch at noon and dinner at seven, I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to a mid-afternoon snack, uh, maybe some almonds or something like that. But um, yeah, there, there's different ways to fast. And, you know, we could briefly, you know, a couple of the, the big things would be, uh, this what we call time restricted eating windows so that you can count the number of hours from the time you start eating till the time you stop eating in a day so let's say my first meal is at 8 a.m and my last meal is at 7 p.m well that would be an 11 hour eating window if i finish by seven and then that leaves 13 hours overnight of fasting and that's pretty reasonable but some people eat within a 15 hour eating window meaning they might start at 7 a.m. and they might st not stop eating their last piece of food till 10 p.m. Okay, that then only leaves uh, what uh, nine hours overnight, right? Did I get that right? Nine hours, yeah, nine hours overnight for their body to be in this in this fasted state. There's a lot of good things that happen to your body overnight when we're not eating. So again, this this is a, a long discussion, but to to give to to keep it practical, leaving your body some time. Ideally, at least 12 hours from the from the last meal until your first meal um, is is a good idea. Um, with that being said, uh, what people can do that's effective for weight loss this tends to be more for guys, but going from dinner to dinner once or twice a week. So if they you know or at least 20 to 24 hour fast once or twice a week, so that if they stop eating dinner by 7 p.m. one day. And then just skip breakfast and skip lunch and then don't eat again until, let's say, at least five or six that next day. And it's not very fun, but it seems to be more preferable uh, than dieting every day for someone. So you can either cut your calories back every day and you're always kind of hungry, or you can just be really hungry once or twice a week. And that can be effective. Now, again, broadly, uh, men tend to do better with that. Women still can take a similar approach um, where – Twice a week, you might only have four or five hundred calories, two non-consecutive days. But uh, they tend to do better when you make those five hundred calories spread across three meals. So a very small breakfast, small lunch, and small dinner, so that there's at least something through the day, and that's and then you're still uh, in a in a pretty drastic calorie deficit on that day. And then the next day you would just go back to eating normally, meaning making smart food choices, but eating you know to satiety and doing that twice a week. It's often referred to as 5-2 dieting. That can be very effective for people. Um, I, I, no, I also think that uh, males do better with fasting, and probably that's because uh, women uh, find it uh, kind of hard to eat uh, fewer yet bigger meals. And what usually happens with fasting is that uh, women unintentionally decrease calorie intake, which could have some health consequences. What do you think about this? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, But again, it goes, so that's why I, I like the 5-2 for women for weight loss. So if someone is not a, a, an athlete and just wants to lose weight, uh, or even sometimes if, if, they're, if they're exercising, um, they can decrease drastically on those two days per week, but then eating full their full needs on the other five days. Now, again, 
eating, it's not the problem to eat those big meals because they might take that 500 calories and disperse them over three or even four meals. Um, and it's, it's pretty doable and it doesn't have any negative effects. At least there's no research showing that on, on hormones or, or, um, you know, no, doesn't, it seems to be relatively side effect free other than the, the mild discomfort of being on that, in that deficit. Um, but again, it's, it seems to be more sustainable than counting calories. I mean, if you put someone on a 20 or 25% deficit every day, it's very tough to do. It's tough to stick to if you're truly doing it and it's tough. Most people aren't going to weigh and measure their food. So what happens inevitably is there's extra calories that sneak in and it just, it's very, it's just not very sustainable. Again, maybe some people can, can make it work, um, both as the, the person doing it or as the, the practitioner, but I just find it's, it's very tough to get people to weigh and measure all of their food. That means they can't eat out and it's, it's extremely inconvenient, but what's much easier. And again, I think the outcomes are just as good, if not better is just saying, okay, on two days a week, here's all of your food. It's going to be maybe a cup of yogurt, a hard boiled egg, uh, three ounces of fish with some, some, you know, salad and, you know, something like that. And that's, that's the day. And it's very simple. And all they have to worry about is, is kind of this small amount of food counting this many calories twice a week. Um, and they don't tend to overeat on the normal eating days. They might eat a little bit more on that next day, but again, it, it can't, if someone can stick to this, it tends to be very effective for weight loss and it seems to be both, uh, also safe. And do you use fasting with your athletes and how does it uh, impact performance and strength gains? Yeah. So I, I'm very careful because it is a stress on your body when you're, when you're withholding, especially if you're trying, trying to train. So I think that concept of five, two can be effective for a weight class athlete. So someone who is like a boxer or a, a, a fighter of some type, because they need to often lose weight, but they need to be really fueled on certain days. But then on other days they can be much less, you know, weight, they can go really, uh, on a recovery day or, Maybe it's a day where they're just working on technical things. They can be much more underfueled. So rather than being keeping someone who's training regularly in a in a constant deficit, I like picking those days of a more drastic deficit. Uh, for the endurance athletes, it's more like what we talked about earlier, where maybe it's just some fasted workouts. I don't think there's much of a place with someone who's doing high volume training for fasting on a regular basis. The way we've talked about, though, again, uh, for some people eating within a 12 hour window is completely normal. And some people that is even a stretch. So if you, you know, there, there's, there's that, which is just really, a, I think a good idea. So if someone's normally eating in a 15 hour window, it's maybe not the worst thing to, to crunch that down to, to 11 or 12, though I wouldn't really even consider that fasting. That should really just be kind of a normal habit. So I guess to answer your question is as far as the strength gains, um, you know, I, I guess I don't do a whole lot of it with someone, uh, training, training heavily. Yes, probably fasting works really well for people who are not endurance athletes and uh, even yeah. for sedentary people, probably. It, yeah, it works unbelievably well for sedentary people or someone that might go to the gym once or twice or just kind of goes for walks um, because it's, it's, it's simple and it's, it's very doable. And, and um, yeah, and now and, uh, what I was going to say, one other type of fasting would be like a, a five-day or a seven-day fast once or twice a year. And there's some benefit to that, certainly not while you're undergoing training, but from just a health perspective. And this is uh, something I've done before, not during any real training blocks, but, um, and again, for people that are don't really exercise and they just want to do something good for their health. So you can either do that as just like a water fast, or um, there's something called Prolon, which is something I really like. It's called a fasting mimicking diet. And it was created by research, researchers at USC um, and it mimics the effects of a five day fast while still giving your body some, some food and some nutrients. So it's, it's pretty tolerable. And I think it's really good from a health perspective. So that's another thing that I've been playing with more and I, I'm a fan of. And the fasting approach, uh, has to do with restricting uh, time feeding, but, uh, what is your take on the macronutrition, uh, ratio when it comes to the protocols? Do you recommend a particular macro distribution throughout the feeding window? When, when someone is doing these fasting things, yes. uh, not, not really. I mean, getting protein is important, especially on those low calorie days. Actually, if someone is doing a four or 500 calorie day, almost half of that could be from protein just to get the most satiety and, and to, uh, you know, preserve the muscle mass. But generally speaking, you know, it's, it's, it's always, I, I, the way I think of macronutrients is you have some protein goal, some 
moderate amount of fat, that should be a minimum. And then the rest is carbohydrates based on their calorie and activity needs. So if someone is sedentary or someone is, let's say, injured, who normally exercises but doesn't, I might start of a, a baseline of, of uh, carbohydrates of 100 to maybe 125 or 150 grams, and then building on that when someone is more active. So I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't often think of macronutrients, again, because people, I don't usually ask people to count calories. I rarely do because it's so, it's just so difficult. It's so, and it's, you know, it's just, so rather than setting someone in that place to, to kind of get off with it, um, uh, I, you know, I often don't, I usually ask people to keep track of protein though and make sure they're getting enough protein. Um, however, with that being said, some people enjoy counting calories. They use using like my fitness pal and they, it's a, just, you know, easy and, and enjoyable. So uh, it's certainly nice when someone enjoys using it. Yes, but uh, what I find with counting calories is that sometimes people don't listen to their body and don't understand that the diet is something dynamic and not something static. And yep. probably that's the problem with counting calories that people don't know how to manipulate and how to increase or decrease them. Absolutely, I hundred hundred percent agree. It's it's so if they're just sticking mindlessly to this number, they might be overeating or they might even be under under eating. It's um, yeah, not a fan of that. Um, yes, and I'd like to uh, dedicate uh, the end of uh, our interview for circadian biology. Uh, what I find most fascinating about circadian bio biology is the connection between light and dark cycles and feeding windows. Do you think that it has uh, benefits to eating your food mainly during daylight hours and restricting uh, food during the dark cycles and when it comes to circadian biology? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's the most simple most effective rule that you could give someone is just eat most of your food when the sun is out. And the reason, and so I guess we, we should give a, just a basic background for, for people that aren't yeah. aware. So we have these clocks inside our bodies and they, they are set by a couple of different things. The biggest thing that sets your body clock, so we have these, these they're continuously running and they're all through our body, is the light and dark cycle, like you mentioned. So that means when you're exposed, when there's light coming into your eyes or through your skin and when there's not. That constant uh, back and forth of night and dark is, you know, it's, it's, we evolved, obviously, it's, it's how life is on earth, and that, this is how we, the conditions we evolved under, and, and it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about it, because it's our body's way of being more economical, meaning it's expensive to keep all these enzymes and all, all these things running all the time, so if we're not going to be absorbing food at night, as we, you know, we didn't for millions of years, most likely, then the enzymes that are, you know, um, th things that do certain things, uh, what's the best way to say it? They don't need to be, you know, they cost money to, to they cost to, to, to express them. So it, 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 let me go back. It's a way to predict what's going to be happening, whether we're eating or sleeping. And so our body doesn't waste its resources, um, unnecessarily if we're not going to be eating or if we're not going to be sleeping at these certain times. So living, eating, is also a signal. So light and dark is the biggest signal for our clock, and that sets the main clock in our brain. So if we think of like a drummer in our brain, and that sends time out through our whole body to the other clocks. But eating also affects clocks, but in our organs, so our liver uh, most notably. So when we eat, that's also sending a signal. So if your brain clock is sending one signal to your body, and then your, eating, your food timing, your eating schedule is sending another signal, we want those signals to be in sync. And when you're eating during the daytime, indeed that is in sync. Now, if you're eating, maybe you work a night shift, or maybe you're just up late and you eat at two in the morning, well, you're sending one signal to your, your liver and your body, and your brain, based on the light and dark cycle, is sending another. Now, we can also confuse it by staring at bright computer screens or telephone screens uh, all night or TV screens. So that is also sending a signal that it's daytime. And, you know, again, you're, con you're kind of confusing your body, which is off often people are hungry at night if, when they have the lights on in their house and they're watching TV. But I, if, you, if, if that same person would dim the lights and turn the TV off and all the screens off, very likely they'd be a lot less hungry in the evening. Their sleep generally improves. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Uh, yes, and I was thinking about uh, artificial light, and uh, I really believe that uh, most of hormonal issues come from uh, not enough daylight exposure or light exposure at the right times of the day. Do you think that uh, uh, by just getting more daylight exposure and being outside throughout the day uh, could uh, some kind of um, rewind the circadian clock in your body and just uh, help you function better? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're spot on. So the reason is, well, one of the reasons, so we should normally be exposed to really, really strong light during the day and no light at night. If you've ever gone camping, that's what you experience. But if you are working in an office all day, there's some dim light. Even what would seem like bright office light is much, much, much dimmer than outside light. So we have this very low level light during the day. And then we might come home and watch TV or keep the, the lights on in our house. So you're also getting this maybe a little bit less light at night, but still a reasonably high level of light. So we're kind of flatlined our light intake through the day, as opposed to, again, living in nature uh, where you get a really strong signal at night and then very low or nothing besides moonlight in the evening. That strong difference lets us really... Uh, or that, that drastic difference lets us send a really strong signal to our body clocks to say, here, here's the clock. It's like an orchestra conductor with a really strong cue. Again, when people go day after day or year after year of, of this kind of uh, almost, again, flatlined rhythm of dim light during the day and dim light at night, it doesn't let our body set uh, effectively. So it's super, super important to get outdoor light. So even just 20 minutes of really strong outdoor light, ideally in the morning, but at least at lunchtime uh, is a really good thing. So people should take off their sunglasses, get outside. Go If you can go for a walk around sunrise like or sometime in the morning for 15 or 20 minutes, or if you can't do that, uh, getting outside to eat your lunch outside if possible. I know everyone's in different temperatures, uh, places, but getting outside is, is just super, super, super important. And I, I think we can't stress it enough. I personally believe that what you're talking about is actually the future of health and the way people will just improve how they feel and how they function. And, yeah. Uh, there is a topic that a lot of people find intriguing and it is night shifts. Do you have some recommendations for nutrition when it comes to people who work at night? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, the thing is some people are constantly like always consistently working night shifts and then some people might work two night shifts, have a day off and then work two day shifts. You know, I, I work with some people like this. So it's, it, it kind of depends on if you're just going to be permanently on this nighttime schedule or if you're going to be going back and forth. Generally speaking though, the more you can keep your food on a normal time schedule. So I know it's tough because you want to eat if you're working all night, but if you can eat, let's say someone is working from uh, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Or, or 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. or something like that. If you could eat a big meal before you go to work and then eat very lightly overnight and then eat uh, a big meal, you could argue this, but I think eating a big meal when you come home and then going to sleep. So you're eating the bulk of your calories, as much of your calories as you can during the daytime and, and, and it can help normalize. And this is based on really only one animal study that has simulated this that I've seen um, and keeping the food on the normal schedule, even though you're working on the off schedule was really protective compared to both working and eating on the off schedule. So I think that would be the best advice though. Again, it's so much easier to say than when someone's working all night, you certainly would get hungry and you're, you're in these lights. So, um, you know, there's not, I don't have a great answer other than the, the keeping as minimal calories. So maybe it's eating salads and, and things that are kind of perhaps satiating, but not, not going to cause a big insulin spike. So that's another way you could approach it is, your insulin sensitivity won't be as good in the middle of the night. So not eating like a plate of pasta, but rather things again like salad that are not going to cause this huge insulin surge. Yeah, so it's probably emphasizing on the quality of the food you eat. Yeah. And I would uh, really like to ask as much questions as I already did, but I appreciate your time. So to wrap it all up, uh, could you share what are the things you currently do and uh, where people could find you? Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much. It's been a really, really fun conversation, uh, and I look forward to staying in touch. I The, the best place to, for someone to find me would probably be my website, which is eatsleep.fit, 
That's www.eatsleep.fit. Uh, also on Facebook, you can look for eatsleep.fit and get a hold of me there. Um, yeah, I think that, and, and of course, I Instagram. I will add all of this in the show notes. And thank you very much for taking the time to share all of this and keep doing what you do because you really, you really improve people's performance and life. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thank you and have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.